one point that next, this week I wouldn't be preaching, but then I corrected myself and said I would be, but I spoke really quickly, so lots of you who don't like that I speak quickly, which is lots of you, missed that. So I get that, so this might be a surprise to all of you, but I'm really glad to be back up here um, just for one, more, for one more week. And if you've been here for a while or if you've been here for a few weeks, um, we're in the middle of a series, and the series is just called Coming Alive, Experiencing Life through the spiritual rhythms. And, and we've kind of taken some time and we've looked at this, we've looked at this series in a bunch of different ways. Um, we've said, we've said, what would it look like? What would it look like if this were to be a p- part of my marriage? What would it look like for me to experience life through the spiritual rhythms in my workplace? What would it look like for me to experience life through spiritual rhythms um, with my kids, with my hobbies, and all of these different things? So we've looked at this from a broad, a broad spectrum of things. And, and the reason that we apply it broadly, the reason that it goes, and goes into all of these areas of our life is this, is when Jesus was here, when Jesus was walking on earth, when Jesus was taking time, he was healing people, he was making a difference, people couldn't, people couldn't get enough of him, the crowds were massive. At one point, Jesus tells his disciples a story, and at the end of the story, he says this. He says, the thief comes only, so the thief, maybe Satan, or the things of this world, or the distractions, or there's all of these things, the thief comes only to steal and kill, and destroy. But I have come that they may have life, and have it to the full. And when we're honest, we've experienced these things. We might not, we might not be Christians, we might not be Jesus-believing people, or Bible-believing people, and that's fine. But this is something that we have all experienced. That the thief comes to steal. Yeah, I stole some joy from my marriage. He came to kill. Yeah, I had a really good profession, and that kind of got derailed. It seems like that was killed. It, something got destroyed. Everything was going really, really well, and all of a sudden, it was not going well. And so whether we believe, we believe that the Bible is perfectly true, which I do, but whether or not we believe those things, um, the, the statement, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, that's something that we've all experienced. It's something that we all know to be true. It's something that we live in on a day-in and day-out basis. And so... When Jesus follows it up and says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full, that's something that we take seriously. And we take that seriously for a lot of reasons. Um, We take it seriously because we believe that Jesus and God at one point were up in heaven having a conversation going like, hey man, there's some really bad stuff happening down there. And God's like, we should do something. And so Jesus came down and lived among us and died on a cross. And somebody who's going to come down and die for you is for you. We'll talk about that. Um, And so we believe it. We believe it for lots of different reasons. That's what Christians believe. And so since it's such a compelling statement, since it's such a compelling statement, we've looked at this from a bunch of different angles. And so as we've kind of gone through the series, we've said, what would it look like if we want to come alive, if we want to experience this life to the full that we actually believe Jesus is promising, what would it look like to be eliminating distractions? What would it look like to get rid of all the things that so easily kind of come in and slow us down? What does it look like to get rid of the distractions? And then we said, what would it look like if we get rid of the distractions to keep first things first? What would it look like to get rid of the distractions and then stay going in that direction? And then we got specific. And we said for Christians, if you're a Christian, this is a specific application. And it's what does it look like to keep kingdom things first? What does it look like to love your neighbor as yourself when it's difficult? What does it look like to continue to show compassion and justice and mercy in a world where compassion, compassion and justice and mercy are not readily available? How do we keep kingdom things first? And we kept going. And as we kept going, we said in order to do these things, we're going to need to listen to God. If we're Christians, and we believe that life to the full comes from Jesus, Jesus has come for life to the full, it means we need to be listening to God. And then last week we said, we need to be silent. Maybe part of the listening is taking the time, and as our tendency is to turn up the volume and block everything out, maybe a better way to do things is to turn down the volume and let those things in. And in the silence and in the stillness, let God take us from where we are to where we want to be. Let God take us from the past that we have to the present and then live into the future that we can have. And so maybe we need to slow down and be silent with God. And all along the way, and this is so important, all along the way, we need to be celebrating, right? I mean, we saw the thing that people, how much people were celebrating before Jesus even died on a cross and rose from the dead. We saw how much people were going crazy before a dude even came back to life, which is a pretty big deal. And I mean, and we've said, we said all along, if we could do all of these things, it would change everything everything. I mean, could you just imagine if we were to eliminate the distractions and keep first things first and kingdom things and listen and celebrate? I mean, it would change everything. And here's, and here's why we think it would change everything. And here's, here's what Christians believe. If you're not a Christian, you don't have to believe this. If you are a Christian, this is what we believe, is that when we let God into all areas of life, life is just better. When we let God into all areas of life, life is just better. And here's why. And here's why. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. 
is that a person who will die for you is for you. If, if Jesus is going to come down and die for you, he's for you. You can't get more for someone than dying for someone. And so when we let God into all areas of our life, we believe it's better because he said, I will die for you. And so if a person will die for you, they're for you. And so Christians, we say, you know what? Since we actually believe that Jesus came down and died and rose and all of these things, right? That if, they'll die, if he'll die for me, he's for me, it's probably better to just let God into all of these areas of life. And so we've kind of, we've gone through this whole series and we've, and we've said, what would it look like? What would it look like if we started to live life through these rhythms? What would it look like if we started to do these things? And so this morning, this morning where we want to go is we've talked about a bunch of different compartments. Maybe if we were to do this, if we were to celebrate a little bit more, maybe if we were to do that, if we were to act this specific way. But this morning, what we want to talk about is what would it look like if we did that with everything? I mean, what would it look like if we did that with everything? If there weren't limits, if it wasn't just on Sundays or just on Wednesdays or just when I'm around this person or just at this time of day, what if it looked like with everything? What if it wasn't limited to just finances? Or what if it wasn't limited to just gifting? Or what if it wasn't limited to just time? I mean, we look around this room and we all have different stories and we all have different gifts and we all have different things we've experienced. We all have different things that we're good at. We all have different things that we want to do. We all have different things we don't ever want to do. And when we look around, if all of us were to choose, whether a Christian or not, if all of us were to choose with everything to act the way that the people in the story we're going to look like were acting, can you even imagine what this world would look like? And we're going to get to that. But before we do, the story that we're going to, the text we're going to go through, it's in Acts chapter 2. Um, if you want to pull out your Bible, you can. When we get to the text, um, we'll have it up on the screen, so you don't need to feel like you want to. But if you want to, you can pull out a Bible, you can pull it up on your phone, you can do whatever you want. Um, but before we get there, the, the way that the, the people are acting at the end of this story is so ridiculous. I mean, it's so crazy. It's off the charts extreme. And so before we're going to just jump into a story and look right at the conclusion, we want to tell the story a little bit. We need to look back. We need to see what happened that elicited this type of response in people. Because when we see this response, our jaws will be at the floor. We will think, why would anyone ever do that? That's so extreme. That's so off the charts. It doesn't make any sense to do. And you're right. If we were to jump into the story, it wouldn't make any sense at all. Which is exactly why we're going to look at the story that happened beforehand. And then we're going to go and we're going to say, what did this look like? What did it mean for them to respond with everything. It was so extreme. And I'm not even going to, I mean, it was so extreme, I'm not even going to recommend that we do that. I mean, it's, it's beyond extreme. It's not even something where I would feel comfortable standing up here saying, this is what you all should do. Because I would have a lot of you very angry with me next week, and I'd be on the hook to feed a lot of you. And I don't want to do either of those things. All right? And so I don't, it's, it, the, the response is so extreme that I don't even know, I don't even think that we maybe should do that. But it means something for each of us. And so as we go, we're going to look at this story, then we're going to see the response, and then we're going to take some time at the end and say, what does this mean for each of us? What would it look like for each of us to, with everything, start to actually come alive and experience life through the spiritual rhythms? So, the story that we're going to pick up, that we're going to tell before we look at the conclusion, is basically this. Is basically this. Is Let's see. This was about, about 40 days after Jesus had gone back up and had, he had been crucified, raised from the dead. And about 40 days later, there was a festival called the Feast of Weeks. All right? And the Feast of Weeks was a festival when Jews from all over, the, all the surrounding area around Jerusalem, they would all pile into Jerusalem. And so there's tons of people, there's tons of energy, there's tons of different cultures, there's tons of different nationalities. They're all piling into Jerusalem, and they're all present. And so there's lots and lots of people. We know, we know from the story we're going to look at that there was at least 3,000, although there was many, many more who were all just together in this area. So there's a lot going on. All right, so these people, these people all show up to Jerusalem for the Feast of Weeks, and this really weird thing that I wouldn't believe happened except for the extremeness of the response of the people at the end, this really weird thing happens, and the, the, the 12 disciples are all sitting in a room together, and all of a sudden, it, the, the, Luke tells us as he's writing the book of Acts that the Holy Spirit came down and sat on these people like a tongue of fire. That's pretty weird. Like, I mean, that's weird. That's weird enough to, if I was telling you that happened to me this week, I might lose my microphone. I mean, seriously, if I was serious about that, people would think Peter had a break with reality. 
This is a big deal. This is a huge thing. If you, if you have somebody writing down that the, the Holy Spirit came down like a tongue of fire and sat on someone, I mean, you're interested, but you're skeptical. Like, that's a neat story, but let, tell me what happened, because I'm not really buying it. And so, so Luke writes, the Holy Spirit came down and sat like a tongue of fire on the 12, on the 12 disciples, and they started talking, and everyone who was gathered could hear them in their own language. And this is a huge amount of people. I mean, Luke goes on to list 17 different nationalities and people groups who are gathered, listening, and there's all, the disciples are only talking, they're just Galileans, they're just talking in one language, and everyone is hearing in their own native tongue. And so they say, how is it that we can hear from these Galileans? It doesn't even make sense. And so one guy kind of leans over to his buddy, he goes, what's wrong with these people? Like, why can we hear them? And his buddy leans back and he goes, ah, they just had too much wine. They just been drinking. Which is like a funny response, but makes no sense. Like when someone drinks, they get less coherent, not more coherent. You all know that. Nervous laughter. I get that. Okay? They've all had too much wine. Yes, some of you are like, oh gosh, that was me yesterday. <laughs> more nervous laughter. Ha ha. They've had too much wine. And Peter hears this, right? And somehow Peter's speaking and they can hear him and they speak back and he can hear. And this is crazy. This is a weird story. This is not a story that you, you hear and you go, that makes a lot of sense. I experienced that yesterday. Let me tell you what happened to me. You can't one-up this story. This story is it. They've had too much wine. And so Peter hears them saying this. And so he stands up and he says, hey, all of you people who can hear me, you 17 different language speaking groups of people who can hear me speaking to you right now, these men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only 9 a.m. Side note, if you're drunk at 9 a.m., talk to me after the service. And that's kind of a joke, but also that's very serious. We take that very seriously here. Um, these men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only 9 a.m., and so Peter stands up and he says, look, you think this was funny. You think this is funny. Like, you can hear us. This is pretty crazy. And Peter goes on and he gives this really long speech. He gives a speech that is far too long for me to go through. And so rather than me go through the speech, I'm just going to summarize it the same way um, that a, a pastor I listened to, his name's Andy Stanley, the way that he summarized it. All right? And this is what he says. So Peter goes on, and this is what it boils down to. If you read it in Acts chapter 2, this is exactly what Peter says to the people. He says, hey, we're not actually drunk. You know that same Jesus? That same Jesus who died on the cross that you killed, well, actually, his Holy Spirit came down. And so Jesus, the Messiah who was doing all of this healing, you killed him. God raised him. We've seen him. Now say you're sorry. And the people go crazy. I mean, they love it. They're eating this stuff up. And that's not a way to make friends. And so the only way you get away with this type of speech is if there was something that was actually crazy that was happening. And so this story is so profound. I mean, there are thousands of people hearing in their own language. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, Peter stops and he goes, hey, we're not drunk. Actually, you know, remember Jesus? You killed him. God raised him. We've seen him. Now say you're sorry. You know what happened right after that? They said they were sorry. Oh, man. Woo. She reads, those who accepted the message, not everybody, but those who accepted the message were baptized in about 3,000 were added to their number over the course of several months during a long conversion process where they dealt with their past. Nope. That day. This is powerful stuff. This is crazy. They had gone from, in Acts chapter 1, it says that the believers were about 120. They have gone from 120 to 3,120. It is blowing up. As we talked about last week, there's a reason that the food distribution service all of a sudden was overrun. I mean, the growth was ridiculous because things were going on that people couldn't handle. And so as the story goes on, as the story goes on, they, those who accepted his message were baptized and they go from 120 to 3,120 on that very day. And here's what it says. The next thing Luke writes is they devoted, one moment, I want you guys to each just think in your life something you're devoted to. Okay, that's long enough. They devoted themselves that same type of devotion, that same type of emotion. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, which was what? Let's say this together. Here we go. You killed him. God raised him. We've seen him. Say you're sorry. And they devoted themselves to that. They went around and they told everybody that, which is not how you make friends. But somehow it did, because what was going on was so crazy. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. Hey, this is a big deal, and we're in this together. We're going to hang out together. To the breaking of bread, we're going to eat meals together, and to prayer. We're going to trust God with this. And everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostle. Well, duh. 
You just had 3,000 people believe in Jesus in a single day. You just heard 12 men speak in 17 languages when they were only speaking one. I mean, everyone's going to be filled with awe about that. This is an understatement. At the end of this story, for Luke to say this is like a tagline. I mean, when we're reading our Bibles, we should be saying this before we read it. There's no other possible response that people can have but to be filled with awe at what's going on. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Now, this is important. They had just gone from 120 to 3,120. And all of a sudden, they had everything in common. These are quick changes. These are snap decisions. They've seen something, they've encountered something, and it's changing their world rapidly. It's not easy to get 3,120 people to have everything in common. That sounds like a logistical nightmare. I mean, like, sorority houses and fraternity houses are bad enough. Like, could you imagine 3,120 grown adults trying to share? Forget it. They sold, they did something. Action, intention. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. They sold to give. They didn't sell to sell. They didn't sell to tell people they had sold. And they didn't not sell at all. They sold to give property, possessions to anyone who had a need. Now, here's now, I don't, here, this is what I don't think we should do. I don't think we should all go home, enlist all of our houses, and all move into this church together. <laughs> that is a nightmare. I don't think that would be smart. I don't think it'd be wise. I don't think that that's what God's asking us to do. If God's asking you to do that, I think you should do it. But I'm not asking you to do that, and don't you dare blame that on me. <laughs> but if God's asking you, then do it. But that's fine. I don't think we should do this. They sold their property and possessions. And here's what that means. Here's what that means. They leveraged everything they had in everything they were for everyone they met. Can you imagine what that would look like? Yeah, me either. We're going to take a quick break. Hey, Karen, I'm going to have you come to the stage, and I just want to ask you a couple questions really quickly. Um, and then we'll finish our story, but you guys don't need to hear the end. I know you aren't, like, hanging on the edge wondering what's going to happen, so we're just going to take a quick break. I guess we'll just stand. We could sit. You want to sit or you want to stand? Here, let's use this one. Okay. So as I was thinking about this this week, as I was thinking about this this week, this is an interesting, this is an interesting statement. It should be on. Good? Yes. Okay. Yes. This is an interesting statement. They leveraged everything they had in everything they were for everyone they met. Everything they had, past experiences, Back in the past, at some point, they made some money. Back in, the, back in the past, at some point, they had done something. Everything that they were, who they, had, who they were, the giftings they had, the passions they had, the abilities they had, for everyone that they met. So I was just thinking about this this week. Karen and I started talking, called up Karen and said, hey, I want to I just do a quick interview in the middle of my sermon on Sunday. So here we go. Quick interview in the middle of the sermon on Sunday. Here's the questions, and these will make sense as we finish and land the ship later. So here we go. Intermission. All right, Karen, question number one. You ready? I'm ready. I'm ready. Yeah, you got to get that mic up. Yeah, I'm ready. Ready. Okay, perfect. In what area do you feel like God has gifted and made you most passionate to be generous? Well, one area is my hearing impairment, and the other is my background in social work and th uh, therapy where I have cared for others so in need. So things that have happened previously that you've done previously that then have prepared you to be able to do something now. Correct. Boom. Question number one. Three more. You ready? Are you ready? I'm ready. Perfect. Okay. What has God done in order to equip you for this? What have the past experiences, how he's prepared you? What's going on to kind of bring you to a place where you can feel like you're, you can be generous in these areas? Well, I told you um, just before about my hearing impairment. When I um, was five, I told my parents that I couldn't hear. And they told me I wasn't paying attention. And I grew up lip reading because I was not hearing. When I was 20... I got hearing aids. Parents, that's why you should listen to your kids. Just saying. And then I had a, a surgery um, in 2004 in both ears. This ear now is um, nerve deafness, so it's not as, as good. This ear is good. Um, 
also a um, also I received a master's degree in social work. Yeah, and so there's been two things, right? Something you experienced, something that just kind of was part of who God made you to be for whatever reason, and another part of the education and the way that you've used who God made you to be, in order, to, right? Correct. Okay. Oh man, this is good. Okay, how? How previously in the past, or how, how, how previously have you found yourself using these two areas that you're talking about, hearing impairment and social work, to be generous? How have you found yourself doing those well, things? Well, with social work, I've worked with a variety of, of um, age groups from um, two to senior citizens, and in a variety of areas, such in ther as with my therapy, with uh, children and families, working with parents, helping with uh, parent with disciplining and with kids, with troubled kids, and as well foster as well with foster children, and um, and, and also with mental health areas in bipolar and um, ADHD and other areas. Yeah. So you've actually started to live in and use the giftings that you've had. Yeah. And also yeah. with my um, hearing it with my hearing impairment, I learned sign language and have done done uh, interpreting. Yeah. And then here's the last question. All right. This is the this is the ringer the ringer question. Um, what are you doing now? What do you feel like? How has God used that? What does it look like now? Um, has it changed? What's kind of, what's kind of the, the, what does it look like now to be generous with those things? Uh, I have continued with interpreting a little bit and, and with my sign language. And um, also I have cared for, um, I've gone out with visiting people who are in the hospital, who are sick, and also visiting people who cannot get out as much. And I've also worked with um, the senior group and have worked with um, the, and worked in the prayer group. Perfect. So involved in all these different areas yes. now. That's Karen. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. <laughs> Let me just tell you guys something. I am not hearing impaired. Oh, Gr <laughs> Greg will want that. I don't... Um, I'm not hearing impaired, so I hear all the things you guys say about me. But the other thing that's actually more important is I don't have this, this passion. I don't have this heart to be doing things, to make communication and being a part of the group and part of a family and part of a fa like church family easier for those who are hearing impaired. I don't have a master's degree in psychology. I don't have a master's degree in clinical, clinical psychology, as I was. I don't have that. I don't have the resources to be involved in that level in people's lives. But let me tell you, Karen does. For some of you, I don't, have, I don't have the ability to go out and talk farming with my neighbor. But some of you do. And the conversations you'll have about farming are gonna be more life-giving for that neighbor than anything they will ever hear said in the morning on a Sunday. And so we all have things, we all have different passions from our past, from our current, that God is hoping to leverage in the future. And here's the thing. Let's go back to this one really quick. They leveraged everything they had. It wasn't just financial, although it was financial. It wasn't just time, although it did require time. It wasn't just how they felt like they were good at things, although they did use what they were good at. But they leveraged everything they had in everything they were for everyone they met. Not one of us with everything we have, no matter how generous we want to be, not one of us could meet all of the needs that we see. And if you do try to do that, you will die. And I'll be at your funeral, and we will tell about how much you are a servant of everyone. But you'll run yourself ragged. You can't. There's too many distractions. There's too many things. We can't meet all the needs by ourselves. But together, with different passions and different giftings and different desires and different experiences and different education levels, all of these things... The amount of difference that can be made is so much better. And here we go. All the believers were together. They sat down. They ate meals. They shared everything in common. They sold property and possessions. Hey, I have this. Hey, that could be really useful over here. Hey, I heard that you had this. Yeah, if we were to do something with that, we could totally make a difference over here. They knew what was going on. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had a need. They leveraged everything they had in everything they were for everyone they met. Could you even imagine? In every day, Luke goes on to tell us, every day, not like once a week, not Sundays and Wednesdays, but they were involved in each other's lives every day. And they continued to meet together in the temple courts. 
They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Let me just tell you, that's like a normal statement in this context. If you have a bunch of people who are choosing to give away everything that they are, everything that they own, everything that they want to be for the service of others, all you have is glad and sincere hearts. Hey, yesterday you gave this away and it met my need. Yeah, that was pretty sweet. I'm very glad about that and I sincerely appreciate it. I mean, this is a normal expression that follows. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God. Let's not forget what they heard Peter say. You guys remember? Let's see if we can remember it. You killed him. God raised him. We've seen him. Say you're sorry, right? And they're praising God for these things. Yeah, you killed him, but he's not dead anymore. And he actually came back and he's the reason this is going on. And let me just tell you something else. If you're doing all of these things and selling all of your things and leveraging everything you are for everyone you meet, you are simply going to enjoy the favor of all the people. No one's going to be upset with you for that, except maybe your husband or your wife. Just get them on board. It's easy. Talk to me after. And the Lord added to their number daily. Again, this is what you'd expect. This seems like some crazy dramatic thing, but that's what you'd expect. Daily, those who were being saved. They leveraged everything they had to make a difference. They sold to give. Can you imagine? Can you even imagine what that would look like? If we were to all just take 15 minutes this week and sit down and say, I have all of these things. I have all of these areas. I've been gifted in this way. I mean, my personality allows me to do this, or my financial situation allows me to do this, or my schedule has, gives me this much free time and allows me to do this. Can you even imagine what would start to happen? I mean, can you even imagine that kind of generosity? The world would be a different place. The, we would enjoy the all of the favor of Turlock. I mean, it would not even be a question. Daily, there would be more people saying, how can I be a part of a people like that who are leveraging everything they have and everything they are to everyone they meet? I mean, that's what people want. That's what hearts, that's what hearts beat for. People being added daily is normal. But here's what happens. Here's what happens to some of us. We get stuck and we say, I, I just don't know. I don't know. And we, say, I may, and we say, I don't have everything to give. And here's what I would say, is that I may not have everything to give, but I have something to give. We don't have to be the best. We don't have to have everything. We don't have to be the only ones, but we can do something. I may not have that much money right now, but I have some money right now. And if I can find anything to give away to something that's good, that's meeting the needs, leveraging what we have, that's worth it. I may not change the entire world, but I can change that person's world. I may not have that much time, but I have some time. I may not be perfect, but I can help somebody. I may not know everything, but I know a lot of things. And if people knew some of the things that I knew, this world would be a better place. And I know that because I know something. I may not be the best, but I have something I can offer. I may be new to this. I may be one of the 3,000. There's 120 who have been at it longer than me. I may be new to this, but I've heard some things that are pretty compelling and I've seen some people do some things that are pretty cool and I can do something. I may not have that much to offer, but I have something to offer. I may be young, I may be old, I may have waited a while. I may not even know where to begin. I may have never even considered it before, but I want to consider it. What would it look like if we were to start to live our lives that way? I mean, can you even imagine that kind of generosity? Can you even imagine the difference that that could make can you imagine the difference that would make if your kids saw you living that way? Could you imagine the difference that would make if your neighbors saw you living that way? Can you imagine the difference that would make in the community and in the schools and in the lives of those you care the most about? Can you even imagine? So here's the questions. Here's the questions. And here's what I hope we do this week. I hope each of us sit down this week and we take time to answer these questions. What is it in your life that you can leverage for others? Is it gifting? Is it passion? Is it time? Is it finances? And here's the thing. For all of us, all of us, it's all of those. 
but in different ways. And I will never tell you how you should use your time. And I will never tell you how you should spend your money. And I will never tell you what a proper expression of your passions are. But I think you should be asking those questions. And I think you should be wrestling those questions to the ground. Because if we want to start coming alive and experiencing life through the spiritual rhythms, life means living. Living is doing. What is it in your life that you can leverage for others? Maybe a question, a good starting question. What are you passionate about? If you could do anything, if you could change one person's world in one specific way, what are you passionate about? How have you been gifted? What's unique to your story? What has God given you that can contribute to this world in a way that maybe other people can't? What giftings do you have? Do you have leadership? Do you have a hard work ethic? Do you have a heart that bleeds for everyone? I mean, what are your giftings? We all have them. How quickly can you start? If you don't answer that question, the answer is you won't start. And that would be heartbreaking. Here's the other thing. It'll cost you something. When we imagine what this looked like and what this felt like, if we start to live and do these things, it will cost you something. It might cost you a night at home with your family because you're going to give that time away. It might cost you financially. It might cost you a vacation because you've decided to give to something different. It might cost you pursuing something because you feel like to leave right now or to do something right now, you, it, would, it would just not be the right thing to do. It will cost you something. It'll cost you time. It'll cost you energy. It'll cost you money, and it should. Because anything worth doing costs all of those things. And you all know that. Because anything worth doing is what you give those things to in your life every single day. It will cost you something. They sold. Not to talk about it. Not to tell their friends. To give. They sold to leverage everything that they had in everything that they were for everyone that they met. Could you imagine what that would look like in your life? Could you imagine if when you go to dinner and you're talking with your wife, you're talking with your family, you're talking with your friends, what you're talking about is how you want to give more of yourself away? Man, I, I really, I don't know where I can find the time, but I just really have this stirring, like there's these kids who need tutoring at the elementary school, and I know that I could make a difference. There's these kids who don't have parents, and I know that, I, I know that I'm busy, and I know we have stuff going on, but there's, I could make a difference. Could you imagine if the questions you wrestled with were how to give more away instead of how to keep more back? The 3,120 who pooled everything in common shared time, stayed together, they had no idea what the outcome would be. They had no idea that each of you hung in the balance. They have no idea that the whole world hung in the balance. And we have no idea what the outcome will be. We have no idea who hangs in the balance. We have no idea who we can affect in the difference we can make, if we choose to, with everything, start to come alive and say, a person who will die for you is for you. If, he, if God came down, if he died on the cross, if he rose from the dead, if he's that powerful and that for me, it's gonna cost me something, but it is absolutely worth it. Can you even imagine? I want to. I want to imagine. What are you passionate about? How are you gifted? What can you leverage? And most important, how quickly can you start? Let's pray. Father God, there are so many things that pull on so many of us in so many different directions. God, and if we're good at something, as soon as the word gets out, everyone wants more of our time and more of our talent, and more of our energy. God, and if we have money to give, as soon as word gets out, everyone wants more of our money and wants us to be more generous. And God, it's tough to sit and listen and think, God, what would it look like to with everything, 
What would it look like to leverage everything we are and everything we have for everyone we meet? God, those are hard questions. And so God, I just pray for each person in this room. God, may you give each of them courage. May you give each of them the time. And may you give each of them clarity to know what to do with what we've heard this morning. Because God, more than anything, we want to be the people who are making a difference. We want to imagine what this would look like. And we want to live a life fully alive. Jesus, it is because you came down, because of your great love for us, and because of the power that you displayed when you rose from the dead, that we even begin to dream these things and even begin to ask these things. In your matchless name, amen. Would you stand and worship with us?